Scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast. Yes, I know it's been over a month since I've spoken with you and I've got behind with my DVD reviews. A couple of you have emailed me asking me if things are okay and, to be honest, just real life's kind of got in the way. But that's not important. What is important, given that I'm so behind with my DVD reviews, is that I review Sharda, the book. Yes, the one that you can win by entering the competition. I'll put the details on the end of this one anyway, although I have had many, many many people interested in winning the signed copy of Gareth Roberts' book. And that's what I'm here to talk about. If you want to know more about Gareth Roberts, I suggest you pop over to see the The Doctor Who podcast and listen to the interview that Trev did there. That's really good. Or even more fun is over at the Hoodcast, where you can hear a fantastic interview with Mr. Roberts. On the subject of other podcasts, the Two Minute Time Lord Give me something to think about while I was reading the Sharda for review. So he suggested that, well, Sheldon from Big Bang Theory be an actor who could possibly one day play the Doctor. While I was reading Sharda, now you have to remember that I've seen the VHS release and I've heard the Paul McGann audio version of this. I just kept thinking that Skagra, the main villain, and his motivations, well, I cast Sheldon in the role. Not the actor, of course. Actually, Sheldon in space. It works really well. If you do get the chance to read the book, just for a moment indulge me and picture Sheldon saying the words. It works. It really does. But for those of us not quite initiated, let's chat for a moment about Sharda itself. Sharda is a bit of an enigma. It comes from a season, well, that has some particularly dodgy stories in it. It's got Horns of the Nymon. It's got Nightmare of Eden. And I'll be discussing that we're in a very few shows' time. But Sharda was never made, and the reasons why it was never made, well, they're spurious at best. Suffice to say that there was a strike at the BBC. Fan myth, or indeed the reality of it, had something to do with the play school clock. Was it a prop? Was it an electronic device? It doesn't matter. The upshot is, Douglas Adams wrote a six-part story, and let's face it, there weren't that many six-part stories available anymore, dealing with a criminal of the Time Lord's and someone with plans for literal universal domination. Adams really liked to give motivations to his villains. And let's talk about Douglas for a moment. It would have been his 60th birthday if he hadn't died in 2001. And I need to say at this point that Adams is, well, my all-time favourite author. It's predictable, and that's fine. I am quite predictable. Boringly so. I didn't even realise The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was anything other than pure sci-fi. I didn't realise it was meant to be funny. My experience of radio drama as a kid was listening to the news hoodlines, or even the goon shows. They all had audiences. I didn't hear the gags. I just heard pure, perfect sci-fi. It wasn't until years later that my enjoyment was introduced by other people saying how funny it was, and I went back to it. Perhaps I just have no sense of humour. Things have been said like that before. Adams' work, especially his early stories, are fantastic, and I will be talking about Dirk Gently very shortly as well. But here, we're talking about Sharda. So the guy writes six stories, well, six episodes. They go into pre-production, most of the studio stuff gets made, some of the location stuff gets made, a lot doesn't get made. Various attempts have been forthcoming to try and give us this story in some form. Ian Levine's apparently working on an animated version. There is the big Finnish version with Paul McGann, which I love. Again, that's got Lala Ward, who, if you happen to buy the audio go version of this story, gets to give you an 11-hour treat by reading the whole thing to you. Yes, Leeson's involved in the whole being K9 thing, which is perfectly acceptable. And to be honest, anything with the tin dog in it gets my vote, which is only right. But it's this version I'm here to talk about. It's a glorious book. It's about 400 pages long. And it's such a great read. Yes, Gareth Roberts isn't 
trying to be Douglas Adams, but he has taken Douglas Adams' original work, his original words, and turned them for himself. Now, there are moments, like mentioning of the Corsair, and a few of the things that just make you sort of great and go, they've been put in because they're the new series, but that just makes Doctor Who one big, massive narrative. I can live with it. I really can. It's not a target novelisation. It's about three times as long. And it's not a Virgin or BBC book missing adventure. They would be darker. No, it's its own creature. And something that I personally think is one of the best Doctor Who pieces of fiction for a long time. Gareth Roberts is a great writer. Anyway... We've always thought this. Okay, I wasn't that fond of the unicorn and the wasp. I'm not going to put my hands up and say otherwise. You've got the recording on your iPod. No, it's so much more than that. It's just a great story. So if you can track it down, get it, read it, listen to it, whatever you need to do, because this story deserves to live. All right, if we'd watched it at the time, it might not have been the classic. And because we're Doctor Who fans, we want everything. And this is a missing story. So fill that gap in your knowledge, buy the book, get it from the library, and read it. You won't be disappointed, and you will enjoy it. And before I go, I just want to read a Whostrology. Remember, Whostrologies are still available by clicking on the link on the main page. The book won't be available until later on this year, so there's still time to buy one, personalised just for yourself. Here's Timothy Wilson's. Born on the 25th of September 1970. Episode shown. He was born between seasons 7 and 8, between Inferno and Terror of the Autons, and on the anniversary of the showing of Galaxy 4 Part 3 and Mask of the Mandragora Part 4, or indeed Mandragora. The Astrology reading. A scientist may leave without a word, while an old school friend, who definitely is not your brother, will turn up and make your life more complex. Why not try to reason with him rather than take him on head to head week after week after week? It is often a good idea to question your mother's motives. Some people are really touchy on the subject of their looks, for good reason. Avoid an astrologer's wrath at all costs, as a change in management will bring a whole new direction very soon. And as always, I think that says more than we can all possibly imagine. And so I'll fade away and get back to reviewing ordinary things for you. Dear, 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 no, sorry. And so I'll fade away and come back very soon reviewing more Doctor Who. Oh, in case you missed it, there may be something after the credits. Be seeing you. The Tin Dog Podcast is proud to announce a wonderful competition. You can win a signed copy of the book Sharda, signed by Gareth Roberts. The prize has been marvellously provided by those really, really nice people at ForbiddenPlanet.com. For a direct link, check the main Tin Dog podcast page. To win this prize, all you have to do is answer this very, very simple question and email me the answer. Name another Doctor Who story written by Douglas Adams. Send your answer and your address so I can post the book to you to tin hyphen dog at hotmail.co.uk clearly marked Sharda competition good luck and thanks for entering you've still got some time to enter because the competition won't be drawn until the 1st of May have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk For someone who has a machine that can travel anywhere in time and space, Doctor Who sure does have a thing for modern-day London. (laughs) Careful, it's that kind of sass that can get a person uninvited to this year's WhoCon. Uh, We're not counting this as a date, are we? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think the right answer here is no. Bug report. 
When a guy asks me to spend time with him, maybe he plans something a little more interesting than hanging out at home watching TV. Even Doctor Who. <laughs> Even Doctor Who. All right, that's it. Who con? You're out. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> Can you tell there's a Doctor Who fan who works on the show? <laughs> <laughs> Lala Ward, uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you, Graham. Now, Doctor Who fans will know about this, but a lot of people won't know about this. There was a, a sort of a story arc written by Douglas Adams mm. that sort of went missing. Yes, well, there was a big BBC strike in the middle of it, and we'd filmed, uh, we'd spent about four days filming in Cambridge, and we'd been, we'd done one studio. So we'd recorded about a third of it, I should think. And then they pulled the plugs and we never got back in the studio and it was the end of a season, so the cast went off, you know, and it never got finished. So it it took on cult status because it, it had had this sort of stillborn... Yes. Beginning. And well, how frustrating, though, because, you know, oh, because people, people yeah. love Doctor Who, and no, the, no, to, to know that there is this great story written by yeah. the fabulous Douglas Adams. Yeah. That, so how, why has it taken this long and how did it happen now? Uh, it hasn't taken... It's come. It's reappeared in various guises. It came out on a very peculiar video once where the little bits we had filmed were shown with Tom Baker narrating the missing scenes, which was all a bit peculiar. And then there was another audio version that I did with Paul McGann playing the Doctor, and now there's this one, which came about, I suppose, because Gareth Roberts, who's the, the writer on it, um, got the rights eventually from the Douglas Adams estate to recreate this in novel form and he's done a fantastic job you can really hear douglas's style in it when i started reading it i thought oh my god douglas would love this it was really in the spirit of douglas which is quite a difficult spirit to get into it really is because yeah. it's a very unique yeah. which is why he's so famous he was very clever very well read very scientifically literate very witty and very douglasy in a it, it, <laughs> other people weren't like him you know because you became very good friends yeah we were very good friends did, did you meet Douglas. through doctor who yes he was our script editor when i joined and he was he was wonderful as a script editor because i think what he what he had which was so brilliant really was he was so childish himself and childlike in a very grown up way that he combined that thing of children and adults, which was what Doctor Who was then. It, it became less and less for children in the end. But, but in our day, it, it was very much for children, and adults liked it because of that, like they liked the Magic Roundabout because it was for children. These shows can take on sort of culty status for adults. And Douglas was that, you know. But it's, it's interesting, because Romana, who, who you played, I, because I, I don't know that much about Doctor Who, so when I saw that you played Romana, I. <laughs> I, I just assumed, oh, you must have been one of the Doctor's assistants. I was. But you were also a Time Lord. Yes, but that, yes, but this particular assistant happened to be that. Yes, because you were the... You, you, don't tell me, don't ask me about how these things work. I never understood at the time. I'm never going to get it right now. No, but I you think... You need to ask no, a Doctor Who fan about that. No, but I think the good thing about a Time Lord is that you can come back, can't you? Of course, you can do anything, yeah, in anybody's body. I mean, you can <laughs> yeah. you can regenerate in, in all sorts of ways, absolutely. Because you were the, sec you were the second Romana. Yeah. Was there a Romana after you? No, I broke the mould, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how, what was your involvement? Basically, because you were... The, they came to you, presumably, because... You, uh, they you... came to me, because uh, presumably, because Tom Baker turned it down. I don't know. Um, <laughs> they came to me and asked if I'd read it, and I, and I thought of, uh, rather hard about whether I'd read it or not. I'm a bit scared of reading funny voices and doing lots of different people and I... Well, can I just say, the bits of... You are excellent. Well, thank you. Really good. I did hide behind the sofa for a bit while I decided whether I'd do it or not and then, then I thought, well, this would be too... It's too good not to and I and I read bits of it and I thought, Gareth Roberts has really got this right, so, yeah, yes, please, I'll do it. And now, to sit down to listen to it, uh, you will need to take 11 and a half hours out of your yes, busy you schedule. you have to be a very serious fan to spend 11 and a half hours. <laughs> well, no, we'll just have it in the car. And, yes, that's you know. true, a long journey. Uh, how long did it take you to do? I think we we were in the studio for about three days. It was wow. punishing work. It was very um, very concentrated but we, we recorded in a little studio in Oxfordshire that I adore which is in somebody's house called Hats Off and it's, it's just a wonderful atmosphere and that keeps your concentration going.
Because, yeah, because it must be very hard to stay on it for that long. Yes, and you do drift around and people slap you down and say, do that again, it was rubbish, you know, so you do it again. But... <laughs> you got to the end of the page, well, you have yeah. no idea what you've been <laughs> no saying. No idea what you've been saying. And John Leeson mm. is in it. Yes, he's the voice of K9. John Leeson was K9 when I was originally doing the programme. And um, he's wonderful. He used, to co- he used to come to rehearsals. I mean, K-9 is a robot dog. And John used to come to rehearsals and sort of crawl about on his knees and, and was so much more fun than the actual robot when you got into the studio. <laughs> he's lovely, John. And I'm so glad he did do this voice. Because watching Doctor Who now, it must be such a strange experience because now the production values on it now are extraordinary. Well, we live in a completely different world. When, we, when I was doing Doctor Who, there, were, there, was, there were no computers. I go back a long way. There, there was no... <laughs> Looking quant- good. <laughs> you, Shucks, do. Yeah, you do. There was no Quantel paint box. There were there were no special effects. We had split screen stuff and blue backgrounds and and spaceships that came out of of, of cornflakes packets, you know, and dangled on little bits of invisible so called wire. <laughs> yes, I love the way they call it invisible yeah, wire. Yeah, it the hilarious. one thing it wasn't no. was invisible. But in a way, you know, that's what was so nice about Doctor Who. Then it was kind of clunky. And but but once Star Wars came out, you couldn't go on being like that. You had to kind of grow up. Yeah, I suppose that did ruin it for everybody, didn't it? Well, no, it made it for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, some of us preferred the clunky days, but most people preferred the thrilling special effects. And they, and they are thrilling, but at the same time, it, it, I suppose what meant that science fiction was less accessible to a television audience. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, I got into terrible trouble on a, on a story once because I was supposed to be creating something that was going to blow up the whole of Paris, and, and I thought this was an immoral story anyway. I didn't think heroes should do things like blow up Paris. What, so what, I was what, that, what did you have taken against Paris? Why did you Oh, not? I don't know. Some baddie wanted me to and forced me into doing it. And, and they did this big close-up, and they realised when they looked at it later that I was actually actually changing the fuse in a 13 amp plug and they were, they were furious with me i was supposed to be doing something very exciting and important <laughs> actually uh, i might as well ask you now craig russell has written in uh, my favorite story was the city of death which that you filmed in paris mm. was it as much fun as it looked and did you love the sc- but you wearing a schoolgirl costume yes you see i chose this costume i thought little girls watch this program and they'll think oh i don't mind wearing my school uniform if i see romana wearing school uniform which sort of happened. I did get lots of letters from little girls saying, I don't mind my school uniform anymore. Mm. I got many more from their dads saying, Core <laughs> school uniform. And I hadn't really banked on that. So. Yeah, that, that's wrong. I'm not going it's to talk wrong. about it anymore. No. Uh, I haven't really said uh, the name. It's Sharda. Pronounced Sharda? It is Sharda. Sharda. Yes. Sharda. Yes. And it, this is the long lost Doctor Who story, and it's published by Audio Go, and it's out now on CD. Is it, we've got to go to uh, texts and, and emails right. because, the, as you, and but you were saying, there's lots of Doctor Whovians yes, outside. There are. I mean, I fought my way through a crowd, and I sort of think after 30 odd years, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Standing out there in the rain still with their autograph books. I'm it, really grateful to them. Yeah, it's, it's lovely. really lovely. Yeah. Uh, please ask uh, Lala who her favourite Doctor is apart from Tom Baker. That's Paul in Hove. Paul in Hove, I think I would say Pat Troughton. Oh, OK. I loved Patrick Troughton. OK. And that's more from sort of working with people. They're, they're all pretty nice. I, I've known Peter Davison for years, and, um, but Patrick was just so lovely. And, of course, you were married to Tom Baker. Oh, God, yes. I was. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, I didn't make you. Uh, uh, you didn't. <laughs> were, and were you, you, were you married to him when you were Romana and he was Doctor Who? Well, it was immediately afterwards, and um, I think it was that. I think it, this is a this is a thing that can happen to actors. You get so used to playing the part and being with someone with work that you you muddle up that and real life in, yes. a, in a way that I'm pretending to love you. Oh look, I'm actually marrying you. <laughs> I'm such a good actress. <laughs> I got asked once at um, at a Doctor Who convention in Chicago. Somebody said to me. Did you and Tom Baker ever play any practical jokes on each other when you were in Doctor Who? I said, yeah, we got married. <laughs> <laughs> but, and people at that time, you know, because the, the two of you were just been on TV, yeah. it must have kind of blown people's mind that the two of you were walking around the streets together as Doctor Who and Romana. Do you know what? If it was blowing their minds, I think they should have been thinking about something <laughs> else. It wasn't that interesting. Um, uh, now, question. Uh, what do you think of the new series and the direction it's taken, specifically the role of the female uh, assistant? P.S. You will always be the number one assistant to me. That's Spencer in Essex. Spencer, I'm really sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not a great Doctor Who fan and I haven't seen it. <laughs> so I don't really have an answer. I hear from around and about that it's extremely good and interesting and Doctor Who has to keep off 
going off in other directions and things. It needs to change. So I guess what they're doing is fine. I just, I don't really watch a huge amount of television, so I don't know. And in terms of your acting career after Doctor Who, you seem to... <laughs> well, no, because what you, acting career Well, you did Doctor seem to Who. stall. And I, was that because of Doctor Who? Was it a choice? What, what was? Did Doctor Who curse you? What happened? I don't think anything cursed me. I think it's quite hard to work after Doctor Who. In America, if you do a series, uh, you, you just go on and do loads of other series. Here, you can get typecast much more easily. And it wasn't easy to work after Doctor Who. And then I just decided there were other things in life. And, um, and I got married rather late in the day, not to Tom Baker, to somebody else, and moved to Oxford and didn't want to spend my life on the M40. And I, I've always had a second career, which is to do with drawing and art and illustration and having exhibitions, which I have now at the National Theatre, which I love, and um, things like that. So I sort of thought, well, I think I'll stop. But you still do... Actually, this isn't your only audiobook. You've done quite a no, few No, I love doing audio stuff. That's wonderful. You don't have to look any good. You know, you can sort of turn up there and look a wreck and, and meet your old friends and... Welcome um, to radio. <laughs> yeah, well, radio's... Both my parents were in radio, so maybe it's a natural gravitation for me to go into audio. And I have to, I have to mention, because a lot of people have emailed in about it as well, is The Duchess of Duke Street. Oh, oh loved that show. Yeah. Absolutely adored it. Um... And I suppose uh, uh, lovely Gemma Jones. It mm. was just fantastic. What are people asking about it? Just uh, saying, uh, yes, how do you look back on it and how important was the show to your career? That's from Sheila Brook. I loved watching it long before I knew I was going to be in it because I came into it right at the end of the second series and I loved watching it. And I and I thought Gemma w was wonderful. Everybody was wonderful in it. And... Um, so when I joined the cast, it was very odd because you knew the place. You knew those staircases you were going up. And I, know, I knew where the rooms were because I'd been watching it for so long. And it was lovely suddenly to be a part of it. And Gemma and I got on very well and still do. And um, lovely Christopher Casanova played my father in it. And Gemma grumbled all the time. She said, I can't understand why as, as we go on and on in this series, I get older and older because I'm meant to. And Christopher stays exactly the same. <laughs> So I had glamorous parents because they were both they were my parents in it. So. Were there only two series of that show? Yeah, yeah. isn't that funny? Because you think, you know, I remember it, and I remember it being on forever, mm. sort of thing. I imagine mm. it was on for years. Mm. Just two series. Mm. Wow. I love. I used to love that chair that was in yes. uh, the reception. You know, that kind of padded. Yes, that the porter sat in. Yes. Yeah, it was wonderful. Lovely. I and mean, every time I see one, I always think of the Duchess of Duke Street. Oh. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Now we've asked you to choose some music. I believe you have. Uh, what have you chosen? I've chosen Eric Clapton's I've Got a Rock and Roll Heart. Is that because you have? I have got a rock and roll heart, <laughs> and I love Eric Clapton. I love blues rock virtuoso guitarists like him and Joe Bonamassa and Stevie Ray Vaughan and people, and it just seemed... It's impossible to choose one song. There are hundreds you could choose from, but I've got a rock and roll heart seemed to describe me as well, so I thought I'd choose it. A lot of what I've been told off. Oh, have you? Tim has emailed in. Graham, please get it right. It is the Honourable Lollywood. Oh, God. No, because you can, you can be an Honourable, can't you? Well, I mean, I am, I suppose, but that's only an accident of birth. That's having a father who had a title that dumped me with one. Because he he's the seventh Viscount Bang Banger. He was, yes. Does right. that mean he... Did you live in Wales or no? No, it's Banger in Northern Ireland. Oh, that Banger. That Banger. I'm sure I know as well. Do you? I do, yeah. No, we used right. to go there on holidays. Seaside. Yeah. yeah, it's very nice. Castle Ward, that's our house. Oh, I see. Mm. But uh, did you grow up there? No, not really. We went there for holidays occasionally. Oh, right. Not often, no. And to do walkabouts and meet the people. Exactly, yeah. yes, of course. Wave <laughs> one's hand in the car. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, with a basket of buns. There you go. <laughs> we made them for you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> um, how exciting, though. Did, I mean, was it kind of weird at school? Was it, a, was it an issue that you were... No, not... the, only, the only issue was, I remember an awful class where we all had to learn how to address envelopes to our parents and everybody was writing Mr and Mrs So-and-so and I had to write Viscount and Viscountess and I couldn't spell it and I never got right how to do it and it, it's actually totally meaningless it's not a it's not a great thrill really it's um kind of meaningless the so, so did it go back and back and back i mean well it, my father was the seventh, the seventh so, so yes it went back seven times it did my <laughs> half brother is now the eighth so oh is he yes 
Oh, so it's still going on? Oh, yeah, it's an hereditary thing that goes on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. you just sort of, you, you assume, I don't know, these things might just go away. But... <laughs> you hope. But... No, not, no, not hope, but you just, well, you just wonder. They're not of huge use. <laughs> <laughs> But do you, you never use it? It's not in your checkbooks or anything? It's on my checkbooks because I have this vague idea it might impress a bank manager. But apart <laughs> from that, I don't think it would impress anyone else. <laughs> they always say it's good for getting um, you know, reservations in restaurants and things. I don't think so, no. It's the honourable lot of ward here. Mm. No, no. Um, <laughs> now, people are asking, because obviously you're famous, so you're, you're married to uh, Richard Dawkins. I am. So how did you meet him? Douglas Adams introduced us. Oh, how funny. Yeah, at his 40th birthday party. And we got married six months later. It was good casting. I think we sort of knew that. Well, how long ago was that? 20 years ago. Fantastic. 20 years ago last great? week that we met, because it was Douglas's, would have been Douglas's 60th last week. So, yeah, it's part of the reason I miss him so much, Douglas, because it's a big part of one's life, you know. Yeah. Well, you always, you always got that connection. Yeah. Because people, did people think you were crazy getting married after six months? Um, I don't think they mostly knew, actually. Uh, OK. Mm, it was quite a secret. No, so. but, I mean, people don't ask, do they? <laughs> but they might find out, you know. <laughs> did you not invite well, anybody? Yes, um, yes. Uh, yes, we did. We had rather a nice wedding, actually. I, we did invite lots of people. But family-ish sort of people, and I suppose... But the thing is, if you know it's going to be all right, there's no point hanging about, is there? Might as well get on with it. Well, I think you should get married very quickly because th then at least you've got some happy time, you see. But you, yes, you, you don't... you've managed to last for 20 years. <laughs> yes. In my instance, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to get in before it, it ends, you know, after a few months. So you know, I've been married several times if I'd, <laughs> if, I'd, if I'd rushed in when I got it right. Uh, listen, uh, we must do some, uh, uh, a bit more business. Uh, Douglas Adams, uh, Doc Doctor Who story arc, Sharda, is out now on... Um, I did say... Audio Go. Audio Go. Oh, yeah. And it's out in CD. And good luck with it. And, Thank you. Uh, and congratulations on it. It's a long time coming, but there it is. Well, there it is. It's the holy grail uh, <laughs> for, for Doctor Who fans. Uh, thank you very much for coming Thank in. you, Graham.